Hello everyone and welcome to this video on the latent change score model. In this video I want to discuss the M plus output file for a latent change score model. Before I do that a few words about this channel in case you are new. Um, on this channel I present weekly stats tutorials about um, latent variable models, oftentimes structural equation models, latent class analysis, mixture models, and other types of uh, statistical analyses. So if you're interested in that, then please subscribe to this channel. Also hit the like button if you like this video. And check out the description for more free videos, workshops, and other resources. In the description for this video, you also find links to my previous videos on latent change score models. So if you haven't seen those yet, then I suggest that you uh, begin with these previous videos, especially if you're not so familiar with latent change score models yet. In this video, I'm going to focus on M plus output for, a latent, for the latent change score model. I also have a video in which I discuss the M plus syntax, the input file for specifying such a model. Here I'm not going to go over the syntax again, so please check out this other video in which I discuss the M plus input file first in case you're not familiar with the M plus specification yet. So in this video, I'm going to show you what the results look like for a latent change score model like this, where we have two time points and three indicators for our latent variables. Um, you can see here in this picture, in this um, parameterization of the latent change score model, we have a tau one factor on the left hand side that indicates the true scores at time one, and then we have a different score factor tau two minus tau one that indicates true change over time or latent change, um, meaning so say true individual differences in change over time are represented by this factor. And this is one way in which this model can be parameterized. And so let's take a look at the M plus output for a model like this so that you can get a sense for what the relevant um, parameters are that you get when you run a model like this and how they are interpreted. First of all, let me show you the model fit. Whenever we fit a structural equation model or a confirmatory factor model, we want to know, first of all, does this model um, fit the data? Is this a plausible model given our data? And so you can see here that this model has 12 degrees of freedom and has a chi-square value of 12.1. Six, three. So this is a very good chi-square given the number of degrees of freedom. You can see the p-value is 0.43, so the model does not have to be rejected at the 0.05 level according to the chi-square test of model fit. The model fits well. You can also see that the approximate fit indices, the RMSEA and CFI and the SRMR also look good for this model. So we can go ahead and interpret the parameter estimates for this model. In the model results, you get the unstandardized parameter estimates in M+. And so first are the loadings. You can see that in this parameterization of the latent change score model with multiple indicators, all indicators load on the time one factor, which is tau one. And you can see that the loadings are constrained to be time invariant. That's one thing that you always want to check because that is an important specification in the latent change score model with multiple indicators. You want to make sure that you have invariance of the loadings across time, meaning measurement equivalence with respect to the loadings. And so you can see the first variable has a fixed loading of one for identification. So for this variable, you get no standard error for the loading. And what is important here is to check that the same variable at time two, so y12, also has a loading that was fixed to one. So you want to make sure that you didn't forget to also fix this loading to one for measurement equivalence across time. The other loadings are freely estimated, but set equal across time. So the 0.623 is an estimate, so you get a standard error. And also the 0.063 for the third variable is also an estimate. You can see that the standard error here is not zero. And you get the same estimates 
at time two for these same variables respectively. So that's what you also want to make sure that these loadings are also constrained to be time invariant. Now, these loadings look very different and you might say, oh, the third variable has a loading that is very small, 0.063. However, um, notice that these are the unstandardized loadings. So the fact that they differ in size does not necessarily mean that, for example, Y31 is a bad indicator of this factor. Um, on the contrary, you can see that all the loadings here are highly statistically significant, or both of these loadings. And so the reason why they're so different here is simply because these variables come in very different metrics. And so if I had rescaled the variables, then the loadings would look more similar, but I kept them in their original metrics, which was very different. So the variables had very different means and very different variances, and therefore these factor loadings are also very different. So this doesn't necessarily mean that those are um, bad indicators. So we can learn more about this from the standardized factor loadings that in M plus are given in the standardized solution STDYX below. For now, it's just important for us to make sure that these loadings really are constrained to be time invariant. And so that looks good. You can also see the loadings are all statistically significant as it should be. Notice that the change factor has the same loadings also. So these are again constrained to be time invariant and by definition they have to then be the same also on the change factor as uh, the loadings um, on the time one factor. Next you get the covariance between the time one factor and the change factor here. That's the negative 16.308. That is the covariance. You can see it is statistically significant. The p-value is smaller than 0.05, so that's significant at the 0.05 level and indicates that there's a significant negative relationship between initial state and change over time. It doesn't mean that this is necessarily a strong correlation, but it means it's a significant correlation and it's negative, indicating that people with initially higher scores might have changed less than individuals with um, initially um, lower scores. That's something that we often see in um, applications. Now, let's take a look at the means also. In this model, we can estimate the means of the latent factors. And so this is the mean of the time one factor, 99.79. And the mean of the change factor is 0.025. And you can see that this mean is not statistically significant. So it's not statistically significantly different from zero as shown by the p-value here, 0.957. And this indicates that on average, there was no change. So on average, there was neither an increase nor a decrease here in this construct. And this is something that is often confusing to people where they say, well, if there's no change over time, then maybe the change factor isn't relevant. However, the change factor also has a variance. So there can also be individual differences in change over time, even when on average there's no change. So this means that some people could have um, increased, some people could have shown decreases, some people may have stayed the same, but there might have been quite a bit of variability around this mean of practically zero. And that's often something that people don't realize is that mean and variance um, of the change factor can be um, are independent parameters, so to say. And so the variance can be strong even if the average is zero, even if the mean is zero. And plus next shows us the intercepts for the observed variables. And here the first intercept is fixed to zero for identification. So again, this is a fixed parameter with no standard error. And of importance, the intercept of the same variable at time two should again also be fixed to zero. So we might want to check that that is the case. And you can see here that that is the case. The other intercepts are freely estimated but constrained to be time invariant. So you have the same values down here that you see here also. That's again important for measurement equivalence across time. Combined with the invariant loadings, we refer to this as strong measurement equivalence because we have now variables where neither the origin nor the units of measurement can 
change over time because we fixed both or we constrained both the loadings and the intercepts to be time invariant. Now you can see that the intercepts here for the second and third indicator are negative and they are statistically different from zero, which means they differ from the first variable, which for which the intercept is zero. And so this merely shows that, again, these variables are in very different metrics. So the second and third indicator have a different mean and a different variance compared to the uh, reference indicator, the first indicator, and that's why we see these differences in the intercepts here. Next are the latent variance estimates. And so this shows us the, first of all, the variance of the time one factor. So the 202.28 indicate the degree of true individual differences at time one, meaning true here, meaning differences, true differences between individuals. So differences that are not explained by measurement error. And then the variance of the change factor is also given. And that is something that is often of interest because that shows the degree of inter-individual differences in change over time. So the 40 or 39.995 here indicate that individuals differed in how much they changed across time. So some individuals showed greater changes than others. And then lastly, we get the residual variances in M+, plus, which means those are the error variances that indicate the degree of variability in the indicators that is not true variability, but is due to random measurement error. And then also, we could take a look at the standardized solution, which is given below as TDYX is the completely standardized solution where both the latent variables and the observed variables are in z-score metric are standardized to have a variance of um, one. And so here you can see now all the loadings are estimated and also the loadings can differ across time, which is also something that is often confusing to people because the unstandardized loadings were constrained to be time invariant and yet the standardized loadings are not time invariant. As you can see here, clearly they look similar um, across time for the same variable, but they're not the same and they need not be the same because in the standardization process, the uh, or the variables, the observed variables, can still have different variances across time because the error variances were not constrained to be time invariant and also the latent variances were not constrained to be time invariant and therefore in the standardized solution the loadings can differ across time because not all the variances are um, required to be um, time invariant. Furthermore, you can see here the correlation between the change factor and the initial factor. Remember that in the unstandardized solution, we got the covariance, which is difficult to interpret because it is not standardized. And so here we get the corresponding correlation, which is easier to interpret. And again, you can see it's negative. There's a negative association between the initial factor and the change factor. It's not very strong. It is negative 0.18, that's not a very strong correlation, but indicates that there is a negative relationship here. Those who had higher scores initially tended to change less over time. And that's often the case, for example, due to a ceiling effect. Those who are already high, they can't show increases that are as strong as people who are lower. So people who are lower initially have more room to grow or more, more room to to uh, show gains over time. And so then often we will see a negative correlation, but not always. Sometimes the correlation is zero. Sometimes the correlation is positive. When, for example, people who are already high in something, in some skill, learn even more because they are already good at it. So it can also be positive. And so those are the most relevant parameters from the standardized solution. At the end, you also get the residual variances in standardized form. The residual variances in standardized form in M plus are uh, giving you one minus R squared. So one minus the explained variance in the observed variables. And so this 
um, then so say plus the r squared that is given at the very end for a given variable adds up to 1.0 in this case for example the for y11 the first variable at time 1 the point 116 standardized residual variance plus the 0.884 r squared will add up exactly to 1.0 because this is 1 minus r squared. And so this shows you that 88.4% of the variance in this measure is true score variance, is to say explained by um, the true score by the common factor, and so that means this variable is very reliable, has a high reliability, and the other um, values are also pretty strong for the other variables, showing that these measures that were used here are reliable measures of the latent variables. There's relatively little measurement error in these measures. I hope you found this video useful as you maybe pursue your own latent change score analyses or other longitudinal structural equation models. Again, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the like button. Also check out the description for additional videos and I'll see you next time.